Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. There is a globally familiar sentiment that defines what it means to mother. And I'm talking about the verb, not the noun. I mean, mostly it's to nurture, to look out for, to listen to, to attend to other people's needs. And when your primal human need to feel valued and loved is being met, mothering is happening. And as it turns out, you can actually mother yourself. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but Yes, not only can you mother yourself, but it is something that is so essential to do, especially when it comes to attracting love. So though nurturing is deemed as a woman's inherent role, I mean, you can do this no matter who you are. I mean, you could be a man, a woman, or any other gender that you identify with. But if you are a caretaker and used to helping others over yourself, and the word self-mothering just sounds awful to you, (laughs) then I want you to really listen closely because being a caretaker is a beautiful thing. But when your focus is too much on others, You end up feeling depleted, resentful, overworked, angry, and then you end up attracting, guess what, lopsided and toxic relationships. And the reason that that is, is that you might do things like people pleasing, shape shifting, right? Like trying to be something that you're not or please others, passive aggressive behaviors, you know, not really being direct with what you want. And then you also might have a really hard time setting boundaries. And so what ends up happening is that the takers love you because they'll take all of that that you're giving them, right? I recently worked with a woman who was the quintessential mother to everyone else but herself, and she always did everything for everyone. She never asked for help. I think she was a nurse, if I remember right, on top of it. She just did everything on her own, and she really spoke about what she wanted or how she felt. And because of it, she attracted men that would really treat her poorly. And she accepted it because she didn't want to cause problems. She didn't want to make waves. You know, conflict was really hard for her and she didn't want to feel rejected. So she just never focused on, you know, her needs and what she valued, like, and that was really herself. So she valued other people more over than herself. And I started working with her on her self-worth. And as you know, a lot of you, I worked on her wardrobe. It started like with what she saw in the mirror. And then I started helping her cultivate more emotional intelligence to express her feelings and learn how to be comfortable flirting and receiving and all of these things that were so hard for her. And I, I'll never forget this story. I might've even told before, but it's just so poignant to what we're talking about is that as the universe has it, guess what happens to her? She breaks a leg. And so now she is left with being on crutches and having to rely on other people. It was like horrific for her, but I was actually saying, and you know, it was a good thing. I'm like, what if you use this opportunity to really receive? And so we, we were working on things. And then one day this couple who she knew just very, um, I guess, superficially called her up and said, Hey, you know, I heard you, you broke your leg and we're passing by. Um, we would love to bring you dinner. And just as she was about to say, oh, no, I'll just make myself some soup, as she always does, she had me in her head. And she's like, oh, my gosh, Kimmy is going to kill me. She's like, "Um, sure. And she she accepted it. And it was just an exercise that really, like, changed her life. The couple came to her. And because of that moment of being just receptive to having these people give to her, she also opened up and she told them how she was single and she was looking for love. That couple ended up knowing somebody to set her up with. And that guy, she ended up dating. So you see just kind of the domino effect that can happen when you really open yourself up and mother yourself. And the truth is, is when you are a pitcher of water and you have all these glasses to fill, it does no one any good to try to fill up these glasses when your pitcher is empty. So you got to fill up your pitcher first. 
And, you know, we'll all experience these bad feelings every now and then and things that don't work out, but it is more about what you do with it and how you empower yourself and demand what you deserve. And there are things that you can do to protect yourself and foster your own growth and joy. So with me today is a woman, I'm so excited for this conversation, who's going to help me talk with you about how to mother yourself and attract the right kind of love. And after 20 years working in human emergence, lifestyle, parenting development, career, relationship satisfaction, women's development, she made it her mission to empower women to use mothering as a vehicle for her own personal transformation. And she believes everyone is a mother. I love this with or without children and believes that we have an existing mother code instilled into us throughout a lifetime of messages coming at us from our own childhood, our culture, and the definition of mother, that it's someone with children. And the mother code can limit us from realizing our full potential as women and that we have the power to rewrite this. So she also has a podcast, Rewrite the Mother Code, that I'm excited to be on as well, and is seen in various media outlets. Welcome, Dr. Gertrude Lyons. Are you there? I am. Wow, Kim, thank you so much. And what a just beautiful, beautiful, powerful story you kicked us off with. That was incredible. Well, thank you. And you inspired that story because I was thinking just, this is such a important topic. I know there are just so many women in general Mm -hmm. who not only have had like upbringings where that was their ascribed role as being the caretaker, but also just, I think the way we are socialized as women overall. And so I, I'm, yeah, I was really excited about having you on. Well, I'm actually really interested in your story because I mean, I know, and I saw your background, but like, how did you get into all of this and focus on self-mothering? Yeah, because I guess if you go way back, and I graduated with a finance and accounting degree and was an economic analyst for the first 10 years of my career, it doesn't seem like a natural, <laughs> the natural, segue, <laughs> the natural, yeah. natural segue, right, but I was introduced early on to personal coaching through actually my boss, the, the economist that I worked for when I got engaged. And he gave me slash us the advice to do premarital coaching or counseling. You know, Mm. we've been married 31 years. So this was quite some time ago um, before coaching was really a thing. So it was, you know, very, uh, you know, out there to do something like that. But I'm forever grateful. And it opened up and started us, started well, first our couple creating a vision and, you know, seeing what it was like to come together more consciously um, in a relationship. Cause I can promise you without that work, we would not be together uh, today. Mm. And so much of what you're saying, right. Has been about me and my self-awareness, my mindfulness, my getting, cr- having a core self. I mean, I was looking to get married. I was very dependent on my own mother, you know, very enmeshed in that relationship. So gee, and and I know you talk about this, like what we're raised with and wired with is what we're going to seek out unconsciously, right? We don't think we are, of course, I would never say like, gee, I think I want to find a guy that's just like my mother, right? I know it's crazy. Like we're like computers, we have these like default (laughs) buttons that we always go back to like, how, wait, how did I, how am I doing this again? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Totally. So it was all about for me, like, you know, finding a guy where I could feel secure and, you know, and kind of continue on in this dependent type relationship. So it really took a lot of deep work and, you know, introspection, but like building a core self and, you know, and, and coming now, you know, and, and we've been, you know, through a lot, as you can imagine, over 31 years, but, um, and our children are leaving the house now. So we're coming back together in a whole new way, but I'm coming back to myself even in a whole new way after, uh, you know, raising kids. And so needless to say, like that journey, there is a, I won't go into the whole story about how it did connect, but it did, the work I was doing with this economist did connect to, um, I was able to connect with people. And when I was doing my own work, it showed that, you know, that was the part of the job I really liked the numbers I could do, but really the personal interaction and being with people and sharing what I was learning, right. Sharing what I was doing uh, with others was really what was kind of getting me excited. So that's when I went back to school for 
you know, this to in coaching and masters and a doctorate and, you know, now have worked, you know, over 20 years in this field. So, wow. That's so very meaningful to me. Yeah. I, I love actually your segue because I think a lot of people can relate to it. Cause I, you know, I work with a lot of people who are scholarly and powerful, whose left brain is highly exercised. And, <laughs> um, this is the journey, right? Like how can you exercise the right brain and open up more the feeling base so that you can connect with people more because, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the facts. It's about the feelings when you're connecting with people. So, I, mm -hmm. I actually, I love your journey and that you shared that. Um, yeah, well, thanks. like how have you then used this concept and with all your studies, both for your relationship and then others? Yeah. So the concept, you know, this kind of core piece of it is, um, you know, the most important, we all mother, and this is men and women, you know, we all have an internal mother. We all need to, you know, learn to mother ourselves. So I, address mainly women because it's, you know, so imminently relatable, but my husband has also worked on, you know, and continues to work on creating a strong internal mother, but, um, you know, that aspect, but the most, so we mother everything, right? We mother, we can choose to mother children, but we mother our careers, we mother relationships, we mother uh, dreams and ideas, but the most important person, but the most left out person we need to mother is ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the tons, and then what I go into around mothering ourselves is more what I was just talking about. And I think what you were sharing with the woman you were working with, right, is what is it to go inside and, you know, have a, a very strong internal journey to discover yourself, right? And so often we want to like, you know, kind of become whole. I believe we're, we're all have this propensity to learn, grow, develop through our lifetime, not just as kids, but that, and that when we become adults, it's our whole journey is of transformation is about kind of reclaiming ourselves, the aspects we lost or, oh, yeah. you know, left behind in childhood. And so oftentimes unconsciously we're seeking that in a partner, you know, like they'll fill that, you know, the, like yeah. I was, you know, with, my husband, there was a security and a solidity and, you know, this, this kind of aspect that um, I figured I would just marry rather than fully develop myself. So oftentimes, you know, when we're look, we're often looking for these aspects of ourselves and, but then when conflict occurs and, and we, you know, get in relationship, we think something's wrong with that, but it's not, you know, it's actually, you know, hundred percent right on and can take us on our journey. Right. But we have to know ourselves first that was the, one of the best advice this couple's coach, uh, Dr. Bob Wright, gave mm -hmm. us at that time when we were getting married was, okay, great. You're setting off as a couple. You have this vision as a couple. Now the best thing you can do for your couple is work on yourself. And, yeah. you know, so the mothering yourself is this self-awareness. It is finding out what your triggers are, what makes you tick, you know, what the, so you can, when you get in relationship you know, you can be more aware, you can, you know, really kind of dig in in a whole different way rather than see that as something that's going to make that that's going to make you whole, you know, or, or complete in some way. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And, you know, there's, there's such a kind of buzz going on about, you know, self-love and self-care and that kind of thing. And I think a lot of people listening to this is like, yeah, I really should do that. But then they don't know, how, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the how oh. to, and I wonder, like, are there certain strategies that you can like give people to get started? Cause I think it's just, it's yeah. overwhelming for some people to think about and almost feel selfish for them, you know, like, yeah, how it can does. I like oh, myself? yeah, total focus on myself as you were sharing. I'm like, yeah, when it, some, I think sometimes when people hear it, they are going to equate it with like narcissism or something, you know, exactly. like just, Oh, exactly. then it's all about me, all about me. And, the, you know, it's so different from that. You know, it's just not that at all. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is this is a journey that you shouldn't do alone, right? And mm, getting yeah. support and, you know, having a coach like you, I mean, obviously me too, but um, that can guide you on it because how are we supposed to know how to do this? You know, and yeah. there's so much research and everything showing you can read books about it you know that will help you about what five percent you know to make a change or ten and even just a, a standalone seminar but it really is the ongoing 
coaching, you know, having somebody in your corner to, to, cause it's hard, you know, it, I think it's yeah. the most courageous work to do, to explore yourself and explore your interior. Um, I think it's I, more courageous than jumping off, you know, like, than, yes. I don't know, bungee jumping or climbing a mountain, but yeah, it's go ahead. so true. No, no, no. I just had a thought about that. And this is so I'm like, I love that you started here because it's almost meta to what we're talking about. Cause so many people who feel more paralyzed in this area rule with more of their thoughts and they're in their head. And mm -hmm. so listening to podcasts, well, I hope you continue listening to my podcast, you listening yeah, and, and Dr. Gertrude, but, um, <laughs> It's a starting point for sure, yeah, but it's also yeah. a comfort zone, right? So you can listen to all this information and think about it, but it's another to actually feel and taking care of yourself is a feeling. And so yes. I like that you're starting with that because that that's, I think the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. And to have somebody, you know, kind of there with you as you go into that territory, I just, I, I, I'm just not going to lie. It's, it's so important. Um, you know, if, however you can find to do that. But then, and I, I, I heard you reference, you know, building your emotional intelligence, right? I think that's one of the, and when I work with people also, it's one mm. of the, the first areas that we really have to open up to and explore um, because most of us grew up in, in spaces or that where our emotions were not acceptable you know, or they're muted in some form or another. Um, and I mean, I even knew better. And I know that I've muted my children's emotions to some degree, you know, we took some steps, I'm not gonna, you know, put that down, but it's, it really is a big journey. So, you know, having, and then, you know, as you were saying, having assignments around mm -hmm. raising your awareness, you know, I, I always introduce people to, you know, in, in our arena, and I know there's, you know, different thoughts and they shift a little bit, but we focus on five primary emotions, fear, hurt, anger, sadness, and joy. Oh, and, like you know, I know Brene Brown adds shame and some others, you know, so that's fine, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, find a framework that works for you, but something kind of around those emotions and then start identifying them, start noticing them. Even if it's not in yourself, can you identify when other people are having those and we raising awareness is you know we huge 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 because we've just sh shut them off to such a large degree and there's more i can say about this but it looked like you were no 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 this is so great on. i i'm just i'm just agreeing with you because i okay, i think the biggest step for you know people to change is that awareness piece because that's another thing like people might just jump to do it like a a strategy or a tip or something like that. But if they're not aware of what's going on and maybe why it's hard for them, then, then you're just numbing out, right? Like you're not really yeah. integrating it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and oftentimes when I say those five emotions, fear, hurt, anger, sadness, joy, one of the first reactions is like, well, why is there only one good one? Right. Uh like, <laughs> like there's four bad ones, you know, negative ones and one good one, but that's one of the big myths in our culture, right. That we're all just always supposed to be happy. Mm -hmm. Like how are we ever supposed to feel good if, if as an, as in our natural physiology and our, we are feeling beings, you know, this isn't something like a, some fluffy thing I'm going to add to my repertoire that no, they're like innate in us. We're they're there for our survival. They all have a function, you know, they're very pragmatic. So even if you come at it from a, just simply like physiological, this is good for my health, you know, <laughs> to have some Absolutely. flow and acknowledge of my emotions and stress levels. And there's so much research, right. As you know, on the, the physiological and the stress levels, when we can just name an emotion that we're having. Right. Oh my and gosh, so much. So, you know, and it's interesting that you said that about the negative and the positive. I actually see it both ways because, you know, I'll talk to people and on the other side of the coin, they only associate feelings with bad feelings. Like, yeah. you no, know, there's good feelings too. So to your point, I think just labeling them both and where the sticking point is for you is what's important. And like, I actually have people download a, an, an app when I'm working with them yeah. to record every time they're having an emotion so oh, that they cool. give that awareness piece. And it's interesting because, you know, you see patterns within yourself and um, yeah, like one woman I was working with, she, she's like, oh, well, I thought by expressing feelings, you meant it's only the bad feelings like TMI, you know, kind of thing. I'm like, 
no, like the fact that you're thinking that is also something to be aware of, you know, like yeah. you, what about when you're excited and you're passionate, like that's where attraction happens too. So she was just like right. scared overall to express anything. Oh my gosh. Just when you brought that up, um, Kim around our attractiveness in our emotions, yeah. I don't know if you've noticed this, but you know, working with people and I'll sometimes put a mirror up after, you know, we have this belief, like, Oh my God, if I'm sobbing, I look terrible. Or if I, you know, we, we think of us in our full emotions as ugly and messy and, you know, I'll often reflect that back to them. People are just never more radiant. You know, so we're so true. present. We have color in our face. Like talk about attractive, right? Like we're yes. most attractive when we're in our genuine, you know, and I'll say genuine emotions because, you know, I'll just name also, I mean, we can be irresponsible or reactive. And part of this awareness is making distinctions of when we're like genuinely in our emotion versus you know, kind of a, a rant, you know, or something, right. or I'm in self-pity versus my actual pain, or I'm suffering versus pain, or I'm, you know, there's, so there's, that's a whole nother, we don't have to go into it quite at that level, but when we are in our genuine feelings, or when you've had like a good cry, and you're just, people are never, they're just radiant and beautiful, I and love that's a, such a that. huge, yes. such a huge belief to break, and I have to see myself over and over again sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly over it, but there's still times where I'm like, oh, it must be a mess. You know, or I hate when people say like, oh, I broke down or I, you know, like, and, or you watch people just wipe away their tears. Like there's something to be ashamed of just all of those things. And, you know, I think we all moving toward that, that aspect of us, we can, once we see it, you know, you can't deny it. And Absolutely. Can, I actually have a term for what you're saying. It's so funny. You mentioned that I call it the charisma glow, yes. you know, it's when people, cause charisma quotient is kind of the whole formula and foundation of right. work. And there's something that happens when people really learn how to be more genuine and authentically themselves. And whether it's their style or emotional, social intelligence, it's, it's genuine and people can see it on their face. It's, there is a glow that happens and whether you're crying or you're happy, it's just genuine. It's real. And yeah. I think that's what it's real. Yeah. It's real. So yep. yeah. Oh my God. This is so good. We can't okay, manufacture so. that. Right. We can't, yeah. you know, it just, that's, and I mean, I used to, I was, well, there are two things that came to mind like early on in our relationship um, as we were, raising our awareness of emotions being a good thing, right? That, mm -hmm. um, and actually this was, actually it was before we started any of the coaching, which was why when my boss, <laughs> one of the main reasons when my boss suggested it, I thought maybe this is a good idea, even though it seems really out there, was um, my now husband and I got in an argument, right? Or I had mm -hmm. feelings about something and he, we were coming back from a trip and he like throws the bag down. And he's like, this just isn't fun anymore, you know? And because I was having feelings, right? And so I didn't know enough at the time either to be like, well, is he right? Is this, is that true? Should I, you know, should I dampen them in, and revert back? But luckily, you know, we moved into territory that allowed us to bring that forward and created a container and a space for us to explore, you know? And that's where, why, you know, again, like coaching is so helpful because you know, you, you need a safe space to go into this territory that's so unknown, you know, so new and can feel really dangerous, especially if you grew up in spaces that where emotions weren't responsible, you know, oh, where yeah. anger was very irresponsible or, you know, their mental illness wasn't tended to, you know, mm -hmm. and, and strong emotions, uh, you know, you, had parents that didn't know how to deal with them. So they dealt with them irresponsibly. Yeah. So that's, of course, that's good. That's a big belief that's wired in, you know, that you have to have a lot of compassion for, you know, we did, but we don't want it to stop us. We want to go into it. Well, and that's really common when you're like an over caretaker, people pleaser, because if emotions are scary, then you'll like call it shape shifting. You'll shape shift into something else you know, to, to just to please others. Cause you don't, you don't want any 
like, you know, conflict or bad emotions to happen out of it. I mm -hmm. love your example that you had with your husband and like kudos to the two of you that you worked through that, because if you, if you didn't have that awareness and the two of you didn't work on it, that's when I think a lot of couples also are go apart because if you didn't show yourself in the beginning, and then all of a sudden you're showing yourself, it's like, who are you? Yeah. You know, and so I love that you work through that. And that's why I encourage people when they're new daters to just show people who you are and put it all out there, right? Put it out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is really good. The emotion piece is obviously a big part of mothering yourself. Are, is there any other strategy that you teach people? Yeah. So once you st start kind of playing in this arena of your emotions, right? And first the awareness of them, then the naming them, and then the, the full expression of them and, and, and seeing that, that how much that can really work. Then um, you can start doing other things in relationship. And, you know, I'm going to name this. I'm not going to say this is an easy, uh, an easy next step, but I like to put it out there as the possibility when I talk about the transformational opportunity in mothering. Mm. Um, so it's transformational to get you know, back in touch with our emotions for sure. But it's, it's then through this self-awareness and knowing myself and being able to notice through my emotions, the triggers in my partner, you know, or in a relationship or someone dating that, oh, like, why is that thing he just said, just sending me through the roof, you know, or if you have okay. children or something like what was, why was I just so triggered that I can then, I, I can name a place in my own development. We have a whole developmental model called the right developmental model that allows you to place yourself in some place in your upbringing where you didn't get tended to or what that person is saying or doing triggers you know um, uh, you know something negative a wound and it doesn't have to be exact but that feeling is there and sometimes it can be before you know, we have words for it, right? In our, in our pre-verbal times. So um, we have this opportunity in relationship to touch those spaces and identify and heal, right? So it isn't just that we want to like kind of get through it. We, we actually want to, this is do the wholeness something. I'm trying yeah. do something, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and heal. So what can I do to myself for, how can I mother myself in that moment that I just had this trigger? I just identified a feeling. I just realized that this is triggering something from my past. I can name it, but I didn't get tended to in a way. So I can tend to myself, right? I can, you know, and that's where things like self-soothing strategies come in mm -hmm. and it can be, you know, in the moment, it might be naming the feeling. It might be taking a breath in that moment, but not just to like get through it, but to, calm my nervous system, you know, so that I can re respond responsibly. So I can give that little me what I didn't get at the time to deal with this, you know, triggering situation. You know, it might be then that I can, you know, say something uh, that I would have been too afraid to say as a little child, you know, um, and I can say that in the moment because I just retuned into myself. That is awesome. Sense. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's awesome. No. Cause it's like a reprogramming is what, yeah. you're doing, cause it, it's hard to override that, you know, like if you look at it as a computer, cause it, it just, it's like a loop. It just keeps going, 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 going until you override it in some sort of like strategy yep. it, it, as you were talking, and then you have to practice it over and over again. Yeah. And yes. just to say that, right. You don't do it once yes, and like, oh. exactly. <laughs> and then, but I'm fixed. I'm, I'm all fixed. done. Right. Yeah. Right. No practice is, is huge. Um, there, there's a woman that I'm working with right now, and I'm actually working with her style first because yeah. I love that. I love how you yeah. that whole outside in, like at first I was like, what? And then I, oh, it, cause it, yeah. But anyway, exactly. sorry, no, ahead, cause it's, I love it's it. totally what we're talking about because she had so much therapy and she had all this like talking stuff going on, but you know, what was interesting talk about reprogramming. She had a mother who actually was very stylish but so much so that it overpowered like her own self-esteem. So like the mom was always criticizing her for how she right. was, 
was this a coaching session with me, Kim? Like <laughs> you just named my whole exact oh my dynamic god. with my own mother. But yeah, please go on. I love. Oh it. my god! In the fi- maybe there's this like yeah, I'm feeling the uh, the juju totally. there with what. Yep. Well, no, because it it was a very powerful reprogram for her, and it was a it was like a sticking point because she really every time she looked in the mirror, she did not see a sexy woman at all, and the mom always was this like stylish, like to the nines kind of woman and loved shopping. But anytime she thought about shopping for herself, it was like, it was horrible. Like that. It was just awful. All the messages from her mom kept firing in her brain. That kind of thing. I don't know if this is a little bit like your story, oh, yeah. but very much. Yeah. So I'm just happy to say it's hot off the press. That's why it's like in the tip of my mind is that Mm -hmm. we worked hard and did, you know, she's in a fuller coaching program, but we just did a virtual makeover. She's getting a photo shoot done today. Mm -hmm. And I, it's just been fun to see her kind of come out of her shell with these clothes that she never dreamed that she could wear. I mean, putting on red dresses and loud colors and even her casual wear just, you know, having more sex appeal in it. And and she's like, Kim, I just, I never saw myself this way. Mm -hmm. And she's, it's an emancipation for herself. And to your point, like she has to marinate in it for her to really like start believing it, but it's starting to happen. And now she was just so excited for the photo shoot where before she was dreading it and she kept putting it off. So it's so important that reprogram. Such a, totally such a beautiful example. And, and you know, to name that you as the coach, you know, you're kind of acting as a, you know, allowing a space for her to both be with the pain that she had around her actual mothering situation and allow that to come up, but then have you be an as if mother for a bit, you know, to allow her more space and more, you know, affirmation and, and, and see these other aspects for her, you know, so then for a while, you hold that space until she's, you know, practiced it enough and been in it enough where she's internalized. And that's the self mother, you know, just to keep underlining the self mothering, how that right. process can go. Well, cause I, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause that was my question to you. So it's not, that you always have to rely on yourself to self mother that sometimes having a coach or a mentor or whoever it is, be the surrogate mother that Mm -hmm. somehow helps you reprograms the, the messages that weren't serving you like that, that is something that's part of the self mothering. Yeah. A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, the ultimate goal is that, you know, we see how much we can provide ourselves and, you know, when it comes to affirmation to get that affirming ourselves is the most potent affirmation we can, we can give and that other, we still, you know, get nourished by others. But when we're thinking it's all going to come out there, it'll never, will never be satiated. It's kind of like junk food, you know, in a way, or like, you know, it's like the good kind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, but when, but when we get, you know, this genuine kind of, you know, mothering in that space, and then we start believing it ourselves and seeing it when with just, you know, that constant reinforcement, then we're on the way to us being able to provide it and give it to ourselves. But we never want to stop. Like, you know, you're not going to, doesn't mean we're, then we send ourselves off to an Island because we're so self, you know, sufficient. Right. <laughs> but we could, but we could know that we could, and it could yes. be a lovely life. Right. And, but that's and to your point, being attractive to others, yes. right? Like, yes, it, it, I guess on one hand, it could be intimidating to a degree. Sometimes when you are with someone that's self-assured and I don't mean like, as we said, like someone who we know the difference, right? Between genuinely self-assured and, and know that they, that they enjoy their own company and you're welcoming them into your life, right? Cause you already have, you already love your life. And you know, you're pretty I'm, awesome. Yeah. And I'm glad you also said that too, because a lot of times caretakers think that, you know, they don't want to come across as a bitch or, you know, stuck up or into themselves and that kind of thing. And I usually tell caretakers, there's no way in heck that you could ever be that because you're not. So even if you think you are, you're, you're normal. Like even if you're doing a little self-care, that's what it's supposed to look like. And yeah. there is that difference. Cause I think what you're talking about, it's more like a comfort 
within yourself and your body Mm -hmm. and your emotions, who you are versus just trying to be something that you're not. And that's, that's the people who are empty vessels. Yeah. So it's, it's the vibrato. Yeah. Yeah. Both, but yeah, trying to be something you're not, um, you know, not bringing your genuine self forward. And then also trying to get from others, what you don't have, you know, what you're not giving yourself. Right. So giving it, uh, over giving it, but then also thinking that if, uh, I'll, I can date it or marry it, uh, <laughs> but you know, whatever it is that you're so attracted in that person, not that you have to become that person, but it's an invitation to develop those aspects in yourself. I love it. We could go on and on. I, I like getting so. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we're going to have another opportunity. We're going to get a, I know. To I'm, exactly. Well, I know we're like kind of heading to the end, but are there any like last words of wisdom or just kind of gold nuggets that you want to share? Um, I, I like to sometimes leave with an action step, right? When we awesome. kicked people off with the first thing you can do is start becoming aware of your emotions. So even though I call this the feelings game, uh, it, it isn't something that is just done with children because my husband and I, still do it today. And our kids, are, we did start it with our children, but, um, and this can be done with yourself, you know, but it's nice doing it with somebody as well, where at the end of the day, you share something, sometime in your day where you felt each of those five emotions, fear, wow. hurt, anger, sadness, joy. So it's a lovely day, way to like catch up. And if, if you're with yourself, you could just journal on it. You know, mm-hmm. you can write it down or just think about it you know, bring to bring back to awareness, you know, some time in each day. And if anybody says like, well, I didn't feel any hurt today. It's just, you did, you're just learning to become aware of it because we're hurt all the time. You know, we're, we feel all those feelings like constantly. Um, but then if you are doing it with somebody in relationship, it's a great way to kind of bring yourselves uh, current in your day in a way. So I, I, I love giving that assignment. That's Awesome. I, and me too, like, and you could tell, like we're both coaches, like the, just those action things is so Mm -hmm. important. And I love also the notion of, of just doing it for yourself, like journaling it. It doesn't even have to be with somebody. That's great. No, that's great. Where can everyone find you? You're you're okay. Well, you mentioned at the beginning, I do have a podcast. We write the mother code with Dr. Gertrude Lyons. I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Gertrude Lyons. I have a website, www.drgertrudelyons.com um, and also on LinkedIn, Dr. Gertrude Lyons. So there's a theme, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Find me that way. Just look up Dr. Gertrude, you'll be yes, good. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been awesome having you. I love this conversation. Yeah. Excited to talk more on your podcast. So definitely check me her too. podcast out too. And thank you for joining me today. You listening. This has been the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kimmy Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And if you want to know more, make sure you go to my site, KimmySeltzer.com. And if you listen to this and you are struck with knowing that you are focusing way too much on other people and you want to learn how to empower yourself to attract love, hop on a call with me. We'll map out a strategy. We'll help you get in touch with Dr. Gertrude. Just take action as we were saying. And remember working on you is working on your dating life. That's all for now.